Okay, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the, the QDP session of, of DIS. Um, so we have several interesting talks here this morning. We have, well, it's morning here in Illinois. There's other times in other places, obviously. Uh, we've got 10 people here, so this is great. And we have our first speaker sharing the slides. This is Fab Fabrizio Grasso. And he's gonna tell us about measurements of uh, beauty hadrons in uh, Elise. So go ahead, Fabrizio. You have uh, 15 minutes for your talk and three minutes for questions. And I'll give you a warning after 10 minutes when you have five minutes to go. Okay, uh, thank you very much. So um, as you introduced, I have a, a presentation about uh, some uh, uh, results about uh, beauty hadron production measurements in proton-proton uh, and heavy ion collisions with Alice. So I start with uh, a bit of introduction for the physics motivation. And I start from proton-proton collisions. So beauty uh, quarks uh, uh, production is, um, is uh, interesting to study uh, a perturbative QCD uh, processes. And in particular, uh, beauty hadron productions uh, is typically uh, described uh, uh, with this uh, factorization theorem, which consists of three ingredients. Uh, two of them are actually not perturbative, which are the pattern distribution functions and the fragmentation functions, which are, which are typically parameterized from previous measurements. And uh, the actual perturbative ingredient is instead the beauty uh, quark production cross-section, which uh, uh, is uh, available at different uh, perturbative orders nowadays. And in particular, I reported a couple of examples. So the first one on the right uh, is uh, a calculation at fixed order plus next to the leading logarithm uh, resummation. Uh, and uh, on the left, uh, the, um, a new uh, calculation uh, that includes also next to the next leading order uh, radiative co uh, corrections. Uh, compared to uh, leading order uh, and next to the leading order uh, predictions. Um, so uh, beauty uh, production is, uh, however, not only interested, uh, uh, interesting for, uh, uh, for the study of perturbative QCD in proton-proton collisions, but also uh, for the study of heavy ion collisions, where we, we now know that a color confined medium called the uh, quark gluon plasma is uh, produced. And uh, in particular, such a system expands hydrodynamically after a pre-equilibrium phase uh, until it cools down and uh, it uh, adronizes again. So uh, heavy flavors and in particular beauty quarks uh, are interesting uh, to, to study uh, such a system because they are produced in the shortest time scales and the QGP formation time and therefore they experience the full system evolution and uh, they're, they're particular interested, interesting because uh, uh, they lose inter uh, energy interacting with the medium constituents uh, via, uh, via elastic and radiative processes. And there, uh, therefore we can use them to study the, the properties of the medium energy loss, in particular via the comparison between uh, beauty charm and, and light levels. So before uh, moving to the results, I just want to uh, briefly uh, show you the ALISA apparatus, which is composed by uh, several subdetectors. And in particular, starting from the, the, the core of the experiment, we find the inner tracking system, which is used uh, for uh, track reconstruction and vertices uh, reconstruction, uh, which is, of course, very relevant for heavy flavor measurements. And then we have uh, a large gaseous detector, the TPC, uh, which is used uh, for track reconstruction and particle identification, time of flight detector, which is mainly used for particle identification, as well as uh, an electromagnetic calorimeter, which is used uh, for the electron identification and, uh, and the trigger. Uh, and these are uh, in the mid cover the mid rapidity region of Alice, while at forward rapidity, we also have a muon spectrometer that is used for, for muon reconstruction and, uh, um, and also it provides a trigger. And finally, uh, the V0 detectors, which are located uh, at the forward and back, uh, backward regions uh, close to the inner tracking system are used for, for uh, trigger and the event characterization. So I'll start uh, <clears throat> with the first uh, kind of measurements that can be uh, performed in ALICE for the beauty, which are uh, measurements of dielectrons, electrons, and in particular uh, via uh, the fit, the simultaneous fit of the invariant mass and PT distributions of electron pairs, we can extract uh, the uh, contribution of uh, uh, CC bar pairs and uh, BB bar pairs that are uh, the, the, the largest contribution at intermediate mass, in particular between one 
and 2.5 uh, GV over C. And via these uh, uh, simultaneous fits uh, with different uh, templates, we can extract uh, the, um, uh, the, com the, the contributions of, uh, of beauty and charm uh, productions. Um, then uh, we can uh, exploit also uh, measurement of uh, hadrons and uh, electrons uh, from beauty hadron decays. And the first example that I report here are uh, gypsum mesons, so non prompt gypsum mesons. And the measurement in this case uh, exploits the fact that uh, uh, gypsum pr promptly produced gypsum mesons. Uh, uh, basically uh, are produced at the primary vertex uh, and their decay vertex cannot be resolved from it. While uh, gypsum mesons from beauty hadron decays can be uh, measured, uh, well, um, are, are more displaced and therefore uh, they can be uh, separated from the prompt ones. And this is done via the simultaneous sum bin fit of the invariant mass and pseudo proper decay uh, length distributions. Uh, a similar uh, approach is used for electrons from beauty hadron decays. And in this case, a multi-component template fit is performed to the distribution of, of the impact parameter of the single electrons. And again, uh, here we exploit the fact that uh, this distribution is wider uh, for electrons from beauty hadron decays because of the uh, relatively long uh, decay length uh, of, uh, of beauty hadrons. And finally, uh, we can also exploit a non-prompt demesons. Again, uh, the philosophy behind the measurement is similar. So uh, demesons uh, from beauty hadron decays uh, are more displaced uh, with respect to the primary vertex because of the uh, relatively long uh, decay length of the beauty uh, hadrons. And uh, um, we can measure, in this case, different uh, uh, dimeson species, uh, which, uh, as you will see, will be complementary and includes D0, D plus, uh, and D sub S mesons. So uh, in this case, the, the analysis strategy is based on the multi-class classification of the different candidate uh, uh, types, so prompt dimesons, non-prompt dimesons, uh, and combinatorial background via uh, machine learning uh, techniques, in particular boosted decision trees. And uh, uh, then uh, the fraction of non-prompted dimensions is obtained with uh, a method that exploits uh, uh, the definition of several selection criteria. And then uh, a sort of template fit, as you can see in the bot uh, in bottom right uh, plot of this slide. Um, so I will now uh, go through the results. And uh, I'll start uh, from uh, electrons from beauty hadron decays uh, and uh, uh, PT differential cross section uh, that you can see on the left, uh, and uh, non prompt gypsy, again, uh, the PT differential cross section that you see on the right, uh, both uh, uh, compared to Fournier uh, calculations. And uh, uh, you can see that uh, in both cases, uh, the, the, the data are uh, well described by Fournier calculations. Uh, just a point that I want to uh, underline here that uh, uh, for non-prompt production, uh, the Fournier calculations uh, include also the description of the decay kinematics of the beauty hadrons to the final state, uh, which is also relevant for the description of our measurements. And as you can see, this is uh, uh, pretty well uh, described. Um, Similar conclusions can be drawn for the dimensions. So in this slide, uh, you can see a compilation for the D0 uh, on the left, D plus in the middle, and D sub S on the right. Uh, again, PT differential cross sections, uh, both for prompt and non prompt production. And uh, as you can see, also in this case, uh, for NLL calculations, um, can describe uh, pretty well uh, the, the measured cross sections, especially in, in case of non prompt uh, production. And uh, in this case, uh, the decay kinematics from the beauty hadron uh, was, uh, was uh, modeled uh, with the PT8 decayer, and uh, uh, the fragmentation fractions also from uh, the beauty quark to the different beauty hadron species that is uh, somehow relevant. Um, was taken from E plus E minus uh, measurements. Uh, another interesting uh, thing that we can have a look at uh, is the fraction of non-prompt uh, uh, hadrons over, uh, over uh, the, the inclusive uh, production. And the, in this example, I reported the measurement of uh, the fraction of non-prompt gypsum mesons measured by Alice 
compared to uh, several other uh, measurements uh, from ATLAS, CMS, and uh, at Tevatron by, by CDF. And as you can see, the, the measurement of ALICE is uh, somehow complementary to the other LHC experiments because it, uh, it allows to measure uh, the, the, beauty, uh, the beauty fraction down to a very low PT, where uh, it's really relevant uh, when we want to compute uh, PT-integrated cross-sections because, of course, the maximum of the cross-section is, uh, is around uh, uh, 1 or 2 GV over C. Yes, you have five minutes. Uh, thank you. Uh, so uh, other ratios that are very interesting to look at are the ratios among the different add-on species. And in particular, this is true for the disabased meson. And in this plot, you can see the, the, the ratio between the uh, production of disabased mesons compared to non-strange dimesons. And first of all, we can, uh, we can observe that this is larger for non-prompt production than uh, for prompt production. And this is somehow expected because of the large contribution of the beauty quark decay into CC bar pair and the strange quark. And the second uh, uh, point that we can observe is that uh, uh, the, looking at the models, the disabased meson uh, get, uh, gets a, a quite large contribution from a bisabased meson, so beauty uh, strange mesons. And this gives us a sensitivity to the B quark fragmentation fraction uh, to the uh, beauty mesons that contains uh, uh, strange quarks. And in particular, uh, with a, a correction to account for uh, the fraction of this abyss from, from non-strange B mesons, uh, we can compute uh, the fraction uh, of, uh, uh, of the fragmentation fraction of uh, beauty quark to uh, strange B mesons over uh, the one of uh, beauty quarks to non-strange uh, B mesons. And as you can see uh, in this uh, compilation plot, uh, it is com uh, compatible uh, among, uh, between uh, the, the, the measurement of ALICE and uh, uh, several other measurements uh, performed uh, uh, at the LHC, uh, the Tevatron, and, uh, and also in plus and minus collisions uh, at LAP. Um, finally, as I uh, briefly mentioned, uh, the peculiarity of ALICE uh, uh, to perform measurements down to low PT is very important when we want to compute PT integrated cross sections uh, that then ca can be used to be uh, to, to extrapolate to uh, BB bar cross sections uh, um, using the fragmentation fractions of the beauty quark into, into the beauty hadron species uh, and, uh, and uh, the branching ratios of the beauty hadrons uh, to, the, to our final state. Uh, uh, particles that we measure. And here you can see uh, a nice compilation as a function of the uh, center of mass energy uh, over a, a broad range from 200 GV, of, uh, GV to uh, up to 13 uh, TV. And uh, as you can see, all these uh, uh, um, estimates are uh, uh, compatible with uh, both for NLL and NLO uh, calculations. And in particular, the uh, more precise and NNLO calculations get closer to the central points of, uh, of all data. Uh, I will now uh, briefly uh, mention also something about the heavy ion collisions. Uh, so as I said uh, in the introduction, these are relevant for the study of the medium energy loss, which is typically addressed with this variable, which is called nuclear modification factor. And is defined as a production uh, of the ratio of the production yields in heavy ion collisions and those in PP collisions scaled by the binary, um, uh, by, uh, the number, the average number of binary nucleon, nucleon collisions. And uh, as you can see, this uh, uh, quantity is, uh, especially at intermediate PT, is higher for non prompt dimesons uh, uh, compared to prompt dimesons. And this is uh, uh, understood in terms of energy loss, and in particular of the dead cone effect, which suppresses gluon radiation uh, for small angles uh, for, uh, for massive quarks. So this is more important for beauty than, than charm. And uh, this is somehow also described by uh, models that implement the heavy, heavy flavor uh, transport in, uh, in, the, in the QGP, and um, include both collisional and radiative energy loss. Finally, before, con uh, before concluding, I'd like to spend a couple of words about the prospects for the beauty uh, measurements uh, uh, of ELIS uh, for the LHC run 3. And in particular, the two relevant aspects uh, are the installation of two, two new detectors. So the inner tracking system has been uh, completely replaced. 
uh, with the newer version, which uh, uh, has an improved impact parameter resolution by a factor three or five in the transverse uh, uh, and longitudinal directions, respectively, uh, which is, of course, very uh, crucial for, uh, for uh, heavy flavor measurements and therefore also beauty. And then the installation of uh, a new detector called the muon forward tracker that uh, will be used to match uh, the muon tracks uh, in the forward muon arm uh, from a new spectrometer of Alice with the primary vertex, uh, and therefore will allow uh, the measurement of gypsy mesons from beauty hadron decays also at forward rapidity via the mu plus mu minus uh, decay channel. And the second uh, ingredient is the expected increase in, uh, increase in the uh, uh, integrated luminosity by a modern factor 10 to the third, both uh, in PP and led lead collisions. And this will give us the possibility to measure beauty uh, mesons and baryons uh, by exclusive decays down to very low PT, both in PP collisions. And you can see an example on the left uh, for B mesons and uh, in a VI ion collisions where you have uh, an example also for uh, lambda B baryons. Uh, so this brings me uh, to the summary. Uh, I hope that I convinced you that uh, Alice can, can play a, a relevant role for the uh, measurement of beauty hadron production in PP collisions and, uh, and can be useful uh, to test the PQCD calculations. Um, we are also able uh, to measure beauty hadron production in uh, lead lead collisions and uh, this gives us insights uh, in the in medium energy loss properties. And finally, uh, with the uh, uh, detector upgrades of uh, Alice in run three and uh, the expected uh, increased uh, integrated luminosity, we, uh, we, we hope that we will be able to uh, perform precise measurements of beauty hadrons at both at mid and forward rapidities down to very low PT. And that's all from my side. Thank you for your attention. Hey, thank you very much for this uh, very interesting talk. So if people have questions, they can either raise their hand and ask them uh, out loud, or they can type them into the chat. Um, I, I guess I can start with one question here uh, about this plot that you have on the, the left, the RAA ratio. With mm -hmm. run three, I apologize for my ignorance. Will you be, I assume the statistical error bars will decrease because of uh, additional luminosity, but will you also be able to extend the, the PT reach of this plot? Yes, yeah, so uh, indeed. Uh, so. Um, uh, as you can see, we already reached quite low PT because it's uh, 1 GV over C. Uh, but uh, as you said, we expect to increase uh, uh, significantly uh, the, the, the statistical uncertainties and hopefully also reach 0 PT. And the other relevant thing is that uh, we are looking at non-prompt D0 mesons here. So the kinematics is a, is a bit smeared uh, with respect to the one of the B mesons. So, uh, it would be, uh, let's say, more direct um, to look at, uh, at the B mesons, but uh, currently in run two, they are not accessible for us, uh, but they, they will be uh, for the LHC run three. So together with the improvement of, of non-prompt D mesons, uh, we, will, uh, we will also have the possibility to measure directly B mesons via exclusive reconstructions. Okay, that sounds very interesting. I look forward to seeing that. Okay, I don't yeah. see any other questions. Uh, so let's all thank uh, Fabrizio and thank move on to our, our second talk, which is from Andre uh, Sodayev. I'm sorry, Sado. That's fine. I'll, I'll let you say your name, I apologize. Andre Sadoev. that's fine, no worries. Uh, okay, let me share the screen, let's start. Okay, okay here we go. Okay, so first of all, hello everyone, and thank you for organizers for this opportunity to tell about our um, work in progress, which is almost finished. Uh, this is work in collaboration with Matt and Ivan, and uh, like from titles, clear that the work is uh, originally aimed at the physics in um, uh, heavy ion collisions. However, as you will see, I hope, uh, throughout, like after this very short presentation, um, it's very close to be generalized to uh, DIS physics at AIC, and it opens many opportunities for such generalizations, not just like in a single way. Um, the work is a little bit technical. Um, so I hope I will be able to explain things without going into too much details, but like you will see, they, they are going to be formulas. Uh, okay, let's start. Uh, the main motivation for this work it comes from the um, uh, principal old idea of jet tomography. Um, the 
logic is following. Jets are main available props of uh, quadrant plasma and heavy ion collisions. Uh, jets going to be important in the IS, IIC. Uh, in heavy ion collisions, the matter goes through non trivial dynamics. It's very hard to study through the soft sector. Uh, in turn, jets uh, allow you to prop matter at different moments, basically giving you snapshots uh, of the matter. So you like make a set of X-rays. Uh, however, the, there is a problem. Just themselves very complicated objects. So to study the matter with jets, you need to understand jets. And the most approach to study jets are either uh, somewhat empirical, so it's uh, hugely model dependent, or if you try to do something first principle, you have to do many, many simplifying assumptions. Um, I will try to show uh, you how we are uh, solving one of the problems on this path towards the tomography, and particularly how we include how we include uh, medium motion effects uh, into the calculation of energy loss, uh, jet broadening, and uh, uh, gluon emission. And then uh, I will try to argue that the same approach can be used uh, to study, uh, at least in principle, the orbital motion of nucleons and uh, spatial homogeneities in uh, the um, To illustrate the main idea, let me first talk about much simpler objects than a jet. Let's think about uh, like a heavy impurity placed into a flow. In context of, say, heavy ion collisions and can be a heavy quark in quark and plasma. So if the quark is moving with relative speed V, uh, one expects that it will lose energy through dissipative uh, interaction. And this energy uh, this uh, energy loss will be proportional to the square, like to velocity. And just by dimensional reasons, it will have some power of temperature and the right power of coupling, which depends on the theory. Uh, or like on the way how your quark interacts uh, with the matter. So to keep it moving with the same speed, you have to uh, like exert some extra force uh, compensating the dissipative force, and that's what called drag force. So we need to drag your uh, heavy impurities through, through, through your matter. This is the force one feels trying to pull to put hand into water and uh, move the hand, for instance. Now. Like pretty, pretty naturally, if you try to study uh, the like the energy loss of such an impurity in the matter, uh, in the case of perturbed matter, uh, you expect that there are uh, different contributions to the energy loss. Uh, for instance, due to gradients of matter, if your matter is not uniform, for instance, there is a gradient of some density, say energy density or like uh, some charge density. You, pre you, you, you will have to apply some force to keep your impurity at rest, even if your impurity is not moving. Uh, such gradient corrections uh, um, definitely discussed in a different context, but for the context of uh, heavy ion collisions and coagulant plasma, they were uh, mainly discussed in holographic setup. So using uh, strongly interacting, uh, using holography as a model, like holographic plasma as a model for strongly interacting plasma in heavy ion collisions. And the force naturally just proportional to the gradient because to the corresponding gradients. So you can look at these works uh, uh, to see like uh, the, the types of corrections arising there. Uh, but they are very natural in the hydrodynamic sense. Now, what about jet? So if you have a jet and you have some flow and new matter, uh, would the jet feel the flow? Uh, the answer is uh, yes, naturally. The, a, a jet produced in, in, in a, a heavy ion collisions, for instance, is going through matter which is expanding. And uh, in the limiting case, it's expanding with uh, very large, uh, like uh, relativistic uh, velocities. So this velocity can be as high as like half of speed of light. Um, so jet going through uh, like moving matter, and this matter also definitely has like some uh, sufficiently large gradients uh, and other uh, perturbations. Uh, the jet itself is more involved object, so it's uh, definitely harder to describe. Uh, but also it starts uh, from some hard scatterings in the initial state, so it's natural to think about uh, perturbative description, uh, not trying to go to some uh, approach like you know, holographic series. And uh, here, uh, the two main tools on the market are uh, the one suggested by Jolas and Levi Vitsif and like the uh, BDMPS, uh, the approach, okay, let's let's not go to the old phonemes there. Um, then uh, these, these two ideas basically based on the same uh, underlying principle. The matter is modeled with uh, some uh, 
uh, color potentials uh, produced by uh, essentially quasi particles of, in, in, in the coagulant plasma, or the same approach like, can be successfully applied to uh, cold nuclear matter, say, uh, in the context of DIS2. Uh, and then the sources are some um, dressed, uh, dressed patterns inside your nuclei. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, these calculations, uh, after the potential produced by matter is specified, uh, usually go into uh, like a set of simplifying assumptions. Otherwise, the problem is uh, getting more and more complicated. And these assumptions are uh, pretty, uh, pretty drastic. Uh, for instance, in most considerations, uh, the sources are assumed to be static uh, in the transfer direction. Um, OK, so now uh, I will follow uh, the ideas from uh, opacity expansion, or like this, suggested by uh, like these guys. Uh, because of uh, essentially it's just simpler to include this velocity for finite number of interactions uh, than trying to resum them right away. Uh, people familiar with these energy loss calculations uh, should more or less understand uh, why it's simpler. Uh, and now uh, I, I will follow somewhat closely the more recent work by Matt and Juan, uh, where they were trying to resum um, as much as possible the opacity expansion for uh, soft gluon emission. Uh, like actually going beyond the soft loons. However, it's not the main part for my generalization. Uh, what is important that um, uh, the formalism is already developed to include the motion of these uh, sources. So uh, each uh, quasi particle or like other so in medium source of this color potential you're going to include in your consideration uh, is basically produced like uh, like a classical potential as, as a three-level diagram. And uh, that's how it looks like. So it's on shell, it has some current. I'm talking about scalar theory, so to, uh, to just to simplify the consideration. Uh, but like for fermionic theory, it will be just like usual fermionic current here. And here there is a model potential for how uh, your matter produces this scalar field. Uh, one of the choices is like uh, famous Jules Ivan potential, and that's what I'm going to use. Uh, mainly throughout the consideration. However, our results is not too much sensitive to the choice of the potential and can be easily generalized. Uh, now, uh, in the original calculation, uh, the, the, the in matter source assumed to be static. And there is this delta function of Q0 saying that there is no energy transfer from your source in matter uh, to your jet. And then there is very particular coupling. Only one component of uh, color potential essentially is large, others are uh, hugely suppressed. Now I'm going to relax these uh, assumptions and I'm going to uh, take into account the fact that uh, if my uh, source is moving, the, there is non-zero energy loss, which actually can be positive and negative. So I can store energy to my jet or take some energy out of the jet. And also like the current just becomes, in the limit of uh, very heavy source, it just becomes the velocity of the source. And this small u uh, is non-relativistic uh, uh, fluid velocity. Essentially, it's just uh, four velocity divided by gamma factor. Okay. So you have five minutes left. Okay. Uh, so what happens uh, in the usual GLB, uh, in the usual opacity calculation at the first order of opacity? You have two diagrams, uh, which give you uh, non, like non-zero like which give you this leading contribution. You need to do averaging. You assume color neutrality, which, which comparing to BDM, uh, BDMPS, uh, the approach corresponds to Gaussian. Uh, Gaussian approximation. And then you get this answer for the leading correction to the distribution of your jets. And is, uh, for using this guy now can calculate, for instance, uh, 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 broadening of transverse momentum. And these are the initial distributions of your source, this J, essentially. So now if I do my calculation, I will find that the, the leading velocity effects are sub A canal, but they are non trivial, they are very peculiar sub A canal corrections, which are just uh, one over E corrections. And uh, without velocity, it's hard to generate such corrections because of you usually need some direction uh, to couple momentum to. Uh, and uh, this gamma double born is a, can, can be obtained from this uh, uh, gamma just by like kicking out this term, averaging, averaging it with uh, like Q per angles. Okay, so it looks uh, a little bit like. Uh, it looks it, it doesn't look transparent. So, however, we can try to understand the physical meaning of the different terms. 
So these two terms comes from uh, essentially this energy transfer. Uh, because of the, that is on zero energy transfer, the, the distribution uh, uh, of the transverse, uh, the transverse momentum spectrum of uh, 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 elastic cross section is shifted. And the same true about the source. And this is the first term uh, is corresponding to a penalty for trying to bend energetic jet and also to some uh, change in the probability to scatter uh, due to change in the propagator. Uh, okay, uh, more physically, now looking at different moments of momentum, uh, what you will see is that uh, now, while normally for narrow jet, uh, actually for any uh, distribution, uh, like you know, meaningful distribution, uh, odd, moment, uh, odd, mo odd moments are usually zero for a jet. Uh, however, now they are non-zero, and there is a whole family of such moments. Here is somewhat complicated formula. Let's try to simplify it. Uh, and uh, here are two limiting examples. All moments in the between are uh, finite and well-defined. So you see that like odd moments of momentum of the jet are proportional to velocity. And essentially, the jet is bending uh, towards the flow of the matter. And that's one of the main results uh, which we obtain. Now we, one can ask what's about the gradients. It was the flow, uh, like the, this thing was the flow effect. So going to the gradients, uh, if you open the hood of this like you no know, opacity expansion calculation, you will see that uh, there are two averaging, uh, the color averaging, and then the averaging over the sources. Um, and the, these two averaging basically ends up giving you some delta function in the two momenta coming from uh, two amplitudes in the amplitude square. Now it's not the case because of uh, say rho can depend on the position in space and time. And if you go through this calculation, and it, the, the leasing effects of gradients are coming from the change in the density of the color sources in matter and the change in the properties of the matter, as this mu is the, the by mass of uh, in, like these uh, matter gluons or like of these matter color fields. And they are definitely related to the temperature. And now, if you plug that, you, that's what you get. This thing also satisfies unitarity as the previous answer. Uh, and if you play further, you will see that again, it gives contribution to the odd momenta. So essentially uh, what you find that the jet gets bended uh, by gradients and by the flow, uh, but the broadening, the even momenta are not modified. Now we also went further and we did calculation for gluon emission and gluon and quoting marks because of for real QCD theory, it's a little bit uh, too much. So like you know, our calculation is already very lengthy. We left it for future, but in our calculation, what we managed to do, we can uh, we, we consider it uh, flowing the effects of flow on uh, a toy model where the not only the quark is scalar but also the emitted uh, gluon is emitted through some scalar lambda phi cube like interaction uh, look in the paper for more details uh, the paper should, should should come out very shortly uh, and that's uh, the answer okay it's a little bit messy but uh, I cannot I cannot help that uh, these guys inside the cosines, uh, they are regular LPM phases constructed from uh, uh, minus components of different momenta in the game. The guys with velocity all, are all sub A canal and disappear if you turn off the velocity, or if you uh, like ignore this leading one over E correction. Uh, I use sh shorthand notations for uh, like light cone wave functions and in our series, some particular wave functions of scalar uh, like, of scale lambda phi cube theory. And there is a nice statement uh, that all such calculations end up to have very similar, in fact, the same form uh, and like up to ch change of the wave function. So even looking at this calculation update in the Tommy model, you can guess how the same thing will look like for real QCD. Essentially, you expect that just like you should just change the wave functions uh, everywhere. Okay, uh, you can massage this, uh, like uh, this, this expression, simplify it, but like not too much. And then like the next step is to really apply it to some uh, observables and see what phenology does, but uh, we didn't yet go for that. So summarizing, we have constructed a generalization of opacity expansion approach for uh, jet matter interaction. And with this tool, one can go further studying very general pro profiles of uh, how the sources are moving in the matter. That in the context of heavy ion collisions, that can be uh, general flow, general temperature uh, profile, uh, general uh, profile of the source densities, and so on. 
uh, as a simple uh, physical illustration of the result, we see that the jet gets uh, the jet axis gets shifted. So the odd momentum moments of the jet momentum are modified, and they are non-zero now and proportional to the velocity and gradient. Uh, we studied gluon emission uh, in, the, in a toy model. This gluon emission can be generalized to QCD at least naively just by playing around uh, light front wave functions. Uh, the full uh, uh, proper QCD calculation is on its way. Um, it will take some time, uh, President Trivial, to deal with uh, the, like, you know, the, uh, the properties of gauge theory, essentially, in this context. For DIS physics, uh, one can uh, I, I, I guess that's more or less uh, clear because of these sources are very general uh, model for any nuclear matter. Uh, now one can try to study how these sources are moving and how this, their motion changes from point to point. So one can try to study inhomogeneities, spatial inhomogeneities in uh, nuclear systems, and also, for instance, study some uh, collective motion in the uh, case of nuclei, uh, and that's uh, say a nuclear orbital motion. So speculating, uh, it should be related to GPDs and CMDs, but it will uh, take some work to go there. And we are again pushing the, like, no, the already uh, some follow ups on that. And okay. that opens multiple opportunities to use the old tools, the old first principle QCD based tools to study jet matter interaction. Now to take into account uh, how the matter evolves. Uh, and uh, like to study, and now you can turn it in two ways. You can try to improve the precision with uh, like with uh, the precision of how you study the jets, but you also try, can try to use the jets as props of your matter and of its properties. Okay, so thanks. I, I'm going to stop you here because I think we're getting a, a little behind. I, I see a quick question from Will. So let's thank. Um, uh, yeah, thank you so much. And I, I'm also aware of the time, so I'll be very, very, very brief. So in the Original GLV calculations, the, the calculations are only leading order in iconality. So sub iconal corrections are thrown away. So yes. in what sense is in this calculation, the sub iconal corrections coming from uh, jets just zero in terms of self consistency with the GLV calculation? Thank you. It just like, I mean, GLV calculation can be more or less naturally extended to take into account like uh, sub iconal corrections one by one. And uh, at least for leading contributions, it's self consistent. And moreover, this contribution is very spatial. So it's not like coming from uh, like the real A calculation, which should go by even powers. But just to be clear, you have not computed all sub iconal corrections then, right? Yeah, yeah. Like it's, it's just the okay, leading. Thank you. Essentially, the goal of this calculation to, com to, com to compute the leading effect of, say, of the flow. Okay. So let's thank Andre again. And I think that sounds like a discussion you guys can definitely take offline. Um, so thank you again for this very interesting talk. Um, thank you. Yeah, and sorry let's move on to our, our next speaker, who is Joshua Koning. Yes. I assume that that is the Joshua I see here. Yes. Can, Can you, you share me? your slides? Yes. Okay. okay, so Joshua is going to tell us about light, ma ma light maison production in a lease. So go ahead. I'll give you a warning okay. after 10 minutes. Yeah. Thanks for the nice introduction. Um, yeah, so it's already announced. Um, I will talk about light meson nuclear modification factor in pilot collisions over an unprecedented PT range with LS. Um, ah, maybe I'll go into full screen and you can see it better. Okay, so I hope you can still see the slides. Um, so let's start with a short introduction of the, the topics of this talk. Um, so the first major topic uh, will be the nuclear modification factor um, in pilot collisions at 8.16 TeV. Um, there we have a pretty new paper, which is on archive since uh, last week. Um, and if you want to read it, feel free to check it out. This is linked here. And in detail, I will talk about the um, PT spectra that we measured up to very high PT, also the extended uh, per zero spectrum in PPA TV, the eta to per zero ratio, and of course the nuclear modification factor. And I will also briefly flash um, some results that we have in PLED at 5T, and then we already have a published paper from 2018 and also some multiplicity dependent results. Yeah, so let's start with a short motivation. Why do we want to measure the nuclear modification factor? Um, so the RPA is uh, shown here on the right um, for 5TV and um, for different um, particles. 
and um, from this um, from this nuclear modification factor, uh, when we compare it to theory, we can learn about initial and final state effects such as gluon saturation, PT broadening, or energy loss. And furthermore, we can also constrain nuclear PDFs as shown in the bottom left plot, where you can see that the inclusion of the Pizero measurement really decreases the uncertainty of the um, of the theory. And furthermore, we can of course use uh, the PLET collision system as a baseline for the lead lead collision system. So now that we have uh, PLET collisions in uh, different energies, namely eight and five TV, uh, we can also look at the energy dependence um, on the RPA. Okay, so um, I'll talk briefly about the photon measurements that we can do in LS. Um, so we have two electromagnetic uh, calorimeters. Um, the first one yeah, is the electromagnetic calorimeter EMCAL, um, and it's a run two extension BCAL. It's a lead scintillation calorimeter and has a fairly large acceptance. You can see it here in red and on the opposite side the BCAL. Um, then we have the photon spectrometer FOSS, which is a lead tungsten crystal calorimeter, which has a um, pretty good resolution. It's shown here in uh, yellow, but it has only a fairly small acceptance. Um, and finally, we have the photon conversion method where we use uh, converted photons. So measuring the E plus E minus tracks um, with the ITS and TPC. And this provides us with uh, excellent um, energy resolution. So now that we have our photons, we can measure our neutral mesons. And this we do um, by reconstructing the invariant mass with this uh, pretty well-known formula. And uh, here you can see two example peaks of the pi zero, one for the PCM method, where you can see the very uh, nice energy resolution, um, and one for the EMCAL method. We describe the background with a mixed event technique and a residual linear background, and then we parameterize the remaining signal with a Gaussian and an exponential tail, and then integrate around the estimated mass position uh, to get the number of pi zeros. Uh, this can all be seen here on the right, where you can see the monitoring of the peak position and the peak width, uh, where the data is shown in the closed and the Monte Carlo in the open markers. And you can see that the Monte Carlo really nicely describes our data, uh, which shows us that uh, we have a, a good calibration of our uh, data of each individual method. So we have one more um, technique of measuring neutral mesons, which is not uh, invariant mass, but purity-based relies on the fact that the opening angle of the pi zero um, is decreasing. Uh, this is shown here uh, in this sketch on the left. Um, so at low and mid PT, the photons are clearly separable into two different clusters. But at high PT, uh, when using the MCAL, the two clusters merge, the two photons merge into, um, into one cluster. Um, and this can be used for uh, up to very high PT. And those clusters we can select via the shape of the cluster, namely the um, long axis of the shower ellipse, sigma square long. And you can see one example bin here on the right um, from uh, a PT bin from 100 to 130 GeV. And the pi zeros are shown in black, while the background, which is consisting of uh, ETAs, photons, electrons, and hadrons, is shown in the uh, different markers. Um, from this plot, uh, you can take away that we have a really high uh, pi zero purity in this measurement. Um, but still, we, uh, of course, correct for the abundance of all the uh, background components and also did some extensive studies of the uh, MCAL performance at high energies and also of the description of this shower shape. Okay, so now that we have the pi zeros, we um, have to apply uh, several correction factors and normalizations uh, to get to the invariant cross section. Let me just briefly highlight uh, some of them. Um, so on the uh, top plot, you see uh, the trigger rejection factor, which shows us the enhancement of the MCAL trigger. And um, taking the uh, higher MCAL trigger, we get an enhancement of about a factor of thousand, which then uh, goes into our integrated luminosity. And these MCAL triggers are uh, very important to get the uh, spectra up to uh, those high PT. And then we apply a standard purity, acceptance, and reconstruction efficiency correction as well as a uh, pile-up correction for the PCM method. Um, and of course, for the pi zeros, we apply a secondary correction, with, uh, which is based on a turret-driven cocktail simulation. 
So now that we have the, um, the invariant cross-section for each method, um, and they are shown here um, compared to a combined uh, TCM fit, and uh, as you can see, the uh, methods are in uh, pretty good agreement. And to give you a feeling on the systematic uncertainties of the methods, um, so for example, for the TCM method, uh, the largest source of uncertainty is the material uncertainty with uh, up to 9%. Um, for the merged MCAL analysis, um, it's uh, the 7 to 10% uh, uncertainty on the sh uh, shower overlap and the energy resolution. And uh, especially for the ETA, also the signal extraction becomes dominant. Um, of course, in the end, we want to have one combined spectrum, and this we do via using uh, a combination with the uh, blue method, which is based on statistical and systematical uncertainties, and also takes the correlation between uh, the different uh, reconstruction method into account. So now we have the uh, invariant cross-section of uh, pi zeros and etas in PLED collisions at 8.16 TZ. You can see them here on the left, as a function of PT in the uh, closed markers, so here for the pi zero and for the eta. And uh, I want to highlight the PT coverage that we achieve. So for the pi zero, it's from 0 0.4 to 200 GeV over C, making this the uh, um, uh, identified particle measurement with the highest PT reach that we've measured so far. And for the ETA, we go from 1 to 50 GeV over C. Additionally, we extended the um, PP reference at 8 TeV up to a PT of 200 GeV later for the um, RPA calculation. And uh, yeah, previously it was uh, 35 and now it was extended using the merged MCAL method. Um, so now let's compare our PLED spectra to a theory. Um, therefore, we can look at the upper two plots where it's shown uh, compared to a, the combined TCM fit. And uh, you can see an NLO calculation in blue, um, which overshoots the data and uh, predicts a harder spectrum at higher PTs. And uh, we can also look at the PPR calculations, which do a fairly good job, um, but uh, they don't describe the shape of the spectra entirely. Okay, so now that we have the eta and the pi zero spectrum, um, we can measure the eta to pi zero ratio, which is shown here um, on the left uh, for p led collisions in the closed markers and PP in the open markers. And uh, we observe a pretty good agreement between um, the two ratios. Uh, to quantify this, one can also look at the high PT constant, which is a constant fit uh, from about 4 GeV on. And both of these uh, high PT constants are in very good agreement. So as expected, we don't observe any system dependence. The more we can now include our new uh, PLAT measurement in um, the so-called world data, so uh, with all the, um, at uh, several energies, and uh, we see a universal behavior um, for all the different collision energies um, as expected. Um, and just to mention it, the, the world average, so the high-PT ratio of the world average is a bit lower than at uh, 8.16 TV, which is uh, due to that uh, we are not fully saturated at uh, 4 GV when we start fitting where most of the up measurements sit, because our measurement extends uh, this ratio to, to, to really high-PT. Okay, so Do then let's come to the off? highlight. Yeah. Uh, then let's come to the highlight, the nuclear modification factor RPA. Um, you can see uh, the RPA for the pi zeros here in closed markers and the eta in open markers. And uh, both uh, the RPA for both mesons is in agreement. Um, as expected, we uh, observe a significant suppression at uh, lower PT and we don't observe any suppression or enhancement at higher PTs. Just to highlight uh, the small systematic uncertainties that we've achieved, they are below 5% for most of the PT range, only at low and high PT, um, they are higher. Um, and uh, we also accounted for the, um, the difference in center of mass and rapidity range um, for the uh, PP reference measurement. When we compare the RPA to theory, we can see that uh, most, of the, uh, most of the theory is in pretty good agreement with the measurement only the NLO calculation using the NCTEC 15 uh, PDF is uh, a bit below the data. Okay, so now uh, let's compare the, um, the RPA uh, uh, between 5 and uh, 8 TeV. 
First of all, we can see that in HEV, we have really a uh, much higher PT reach. And so we can probe larger IQ squared high and also lower X at low PT. Um, and uh, now let's focus here on the region uh, at low T, so below 20 uh, GV. There we can build the ratio of both RPA, which is shown here on the left plot. And we can see that the uh, RPA in ATV actually, uh, um, in ATV we observe a larger uh, suppression than in 5TV, but uh, they are still compatible within their uncertainties also because of the large normalization uncertainty. And if we compare this ratio to theory, we see that the energy loss model breaks only a very small energy dependence, but for example, the color glass condensate model and predicts a stronger, uh, strong energy dependence uh, of up to two to three percent, uh, which would um, uh, mean that we have gluon saturation effects or possibly stronger shadowing in the NPDFs. Okay, um, then let's uh, compare our measurement to uh, other measurements, uh, for example, from uh, CMS. They measure charged hadrons, uh, also up to very high PT, and observe an enhancement at uh, higher PTs, and uh, this. Uh, is not confirmed by our measurements, so we don't observe any enhancement at uh, higher PTs. Okay, let's briefly flash some results from PLED at 5TV. As I already mentioned, there we have a published paper with the LHC Run 1 data, and we have also some uh, prelim preliminary results on the multiplicity dependent analysis with different estimators shown here for the hybrid estimator and for the view 0 8 um, estimator, where you can see that. They differ, but um, uh, this means uh, that the uh, multiplicity uh, estimation in PLED is uh, a bit more tricky than in LED-LED. Um, so uh, to briefly, hi briefly hi highlight the ongoing analyses, um, so there's still much more statistics on tape for PLED 5TV. We have six times more statistics uh, in the RUN2 data, which is not yet published. And also we now have the PP data at the same center of mass energy. Um, which um, will then in the end reduce the normalization uncertainty. So to summarize, I showed the Pazirian etanesian differential invariant cross-section in PLED and PP collisions at ATV. Um, this is the highest identified particle PT spectra so far that we've measured. Um, I showed you the eta to plus zero ratio for the different energies and collision systems and that they are in agreement. I showed you the RPA in PLED at 8.16 TV. We don't observe any suppression or enhancement for PT larger than 10 GV, and we have a hint at a larger suppression at low PT uh, compared to the PLED at 5 TV. And as an outlook, uh, we still have much data on tape, which is currently being analyzed and which will hopefully in the end reveal if we really have a larger suppression in H compared to 5 TV. Yeah, thanks. Okay, thanks a lot for uh, this very interesting talk. So I, uh, if you have a question, please raise your hand. I actually have a question. If you could go back to slide five. It's probably somewhat Which of a, a technical question. Yes. I apologize. Um, here, the, the peak position in the EM cal or the EMC moves quite a bit mm -hmm. uh, above 10 GV. Do you understand that? Yes, um, so this is actually due to uh, the merging that we then later on use in, uh, in the merged MCAL method. So from 10 GV on the clusters start to merge. And this means that in the invariant mass, we see that the, uh, we cannot uh, anymore reconstruct those low invariant masses. So the okay. peak will get uh, taken away from the, from the left side and this causes the peak position to move in the end. Okay, yeah, I figured it must be something like that, but I'm not an expert in pi zero reconstruction. Okay, this is great. Uh, are there other questions? Uh, so these are, these are definitely very interesting measurements and, and thanks a lot. Okay, so okay. let's thank Joshua again, virtually. Um, Okay, so our next speaker is, um, sorry, lost the tab here, is Alexandre Shebetai. And is he here? So I don't see 
an obvious match of the name looking through the chat. Am I missing somebody? There you are. Okay. Can you unmute and share your slides? Yes, can also you are talking to me, I guess, yes. Yes. Okay, sure. I will I will uh, share in one second. Okay, thank you. Sorry for the delay. No, nope, no problem. So this is, I will introduce you. This is another Elise talk. This is on inclusive and heavy flavored jet production in, in PP and proton lead collisions and search for jet quenching effects. So I see that the sharing should start here in a sec. Again, having to. Ah, now I see it. You see it? Yes. Okay. Okay, so I'll give you a warning after 10 minutes. Okay, thank you. So uh, today we'll talk about inclusive and heavy flavor jet pollution in PP and uh, pilot collisions and search for uh, jet crunching effects with the LEC experiment at the LHC. So uh, to start with, uh, when you have uh, so-called uh, PP hard collisions, uh, you get uh, um, pattern shower. After ionization, you get, of course, a uh, uh, hadron shower. And then if you cluster them uh, into a jet uh, by opening a cone or using a recombination algorithm, uh, you will get uh, your jet and then you will measure it uh, using your detector. In Alice, we have two kinds of jet measurements. The charge jets are from our TPC and ITS, uh, and uh, the full jets are including the kilometers, EMK and DCAL. So uh, at LHC, you can uh, basically look at uh, three systems uh, in PPE. So you have the vacuum case where you look at uh, testing uh, PQCD and QCD. Uh, in the PLED, you are uh, interested in looking at conical effects. And in uh, LED, uh, you study uh, the medium uh, uh, loss uh, and try to characterize your QGP. So, uh, well, you can look at that uh, in, in two ways. Uh, experimentally, you can uh, define a very uh, uh, properly robust and uh, well-defined uh, observables. And then you can test and try to constrain uh, uh, QCD uh, from first principle or build models compared to them. So in this talk, I'll talk about the measurement of the three systems and we'll discuss uh, two kind of uh, jet measurements, jet production, uh, and then we will go to more differential uh, jet structure measurements. And uh, we will uh, also discuss about how, a bit about how they are made, uh, compare standard to machine learning methods. And uh, I will show you some uh, jet production, jet fragmentation, groomed and ungroomed uh, sub uh, jet structure, and uh, finish with 100 plus jet uh, measurements. So on this slide, you can see two measurements of the jet cross-section uh, for the ratio parameter of uh, 0.4 in uh, PP and uh, lead lead at uh, 5 and 13 TeV. Uh, the left plot is showing you charge jets at uh, 13 TeV going up to 100 uh, GV in PT uh, compared to uh, PQCD. And you see that the POEC and PTI-8 is uh, uh, agreeing quite well with our data. Then if you look at the, at the right plot, you can see a comparison between the full jet measurement, including again the calometer for the same uh, resolution parameter of, of 0.4. And you have a comparison between the PP and the uh, lead lead uh, spectra. Then if you do uh, those two spectra and uh, you uh, divide them uh, and normalize them at the so-called TA factor, you get uh, what we call the, 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 um, uh, the RA, uh, which is uh, uh, a measure of the uh, density of, of, of the medium, or you can also look at energy loss using, the, using it. Uh, you have it at the uh, uh, right uh, on, the, on the slide, uh, you can see that it's quite, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, compared to some, uh, to some uh, fast Monte Carlos, and it agrees quite well with fractional energy loss. 
And uh, we have two measurements of it. One with the standard method, uh, uh, assessing the verification of background with a standard method co uh, called the raw base method. And a new one, which is using a machine learning method, uh, which goes to uh, low PT, starting at 40 dV. Then uh, what you can also do uh, is uh, uh, vary the resolution parameter. And if you do that, you get a plot like the one on the left. Uh, and you see the curves are increasing, uh, showing you that more um, higher PT jets are more correlated. And uh, you have nice agreement with uh, PTR. Now then, uh, if you if you then look at uh, the next class of the of the I want to discuss here, so called uh, jet shapes. Uh, so what are they? they? You have two classes of them. Uh, so what you do is you uh, go inside your jets and you look at the constituents. So either you build a standard function of the constituents, I will uh, come back to it, or you can also look at, uh, if you use grooming, uh, with that we will uh, try to explain, uh, you can look at the clustering history of your jets. Alice has a full program uh, working on uh, settings of observers. And uh, I will also go into uh, showing you our fragmentation functions, which is a special case where you only uh, include the leading uh, particle uh, inside your jet. And uh, you can also, of course, look at the uh, pattern shower evolution. You have a gluon, which is radiating quarks in this uh, schematic here on the, but on the middle of the, of the slide. And uh, due to a color clearance, uh, you get uh, um, you get uh, a limiting angle, uh, which will, uh, uh, which is due to QCD and depends on the on the particle species and the mass. Uh, and uh, this is so called uh, uh, um, angular ordering. I will call. I will come back to it afterwards. So if you look at the fragmentation function as function of z, where z is uh, is uh, the PT of the tracks over the PT of the jet, uh, you can see that you have those curves as function of jet PT from uh, 5 to 10 up to uh, 60 to 80 GV. And uh, you see that uh, you have a kind of uh, scaling, the points are aligned for z uh, uh, greater than 0.1 uh, as function of the FPT. And uh, you have kind of uh, uh, breaking between uh, the soft regime and the hard regime at about 5 to 10 GV. Then you can do a bit more and add the PID. Uh, to those measurements, and you can get uh, identified uh, fragmentation functions for uh, pion, kion, and uh, proton. Uh, you can see that uh, those are quite similar, and you can also see the scaling as function of the LPT for z of charged particle greater than 0.2. Then you can also plot the data as function of a new variable, which is called xi, which is a log of uh, 1 over z. And you get this nice uh, plateau, this curve uh, with a uh, plateau shape. And for xi less than 0.2, you get the same uh, behavior as the, the one I was discussing uh, for the descaling. And then if you go to higher xi, you see you have a plateau and uh, you get a uh, uh, decreasing curve at the end uh, for higher xi. Uh, so you get uh, depression of low momentum particles. Uh, and this is uh, indeed a, a um, a consequence of the QCD coherence uh, effect I was discussing on the introduction slide a minute ago. So when you increase your DPT, you will increase the area of the curve uh, as you get uh, higher particle multiplicity inside your jets, and you have a shift to the maximum. You can compare those uh, those uh, uh, curves to so-called uh, modified linear approximation, which we are working with, with, which we are working on right now. Then you can do a, a bit more and uh, look at the moments of the fragmentation function defined as it is written on the formula on the top of the slide. So you get the integral of z to the power n dn dz normalized correctly. You get this, this uh, strange and quite nice uh, uh, distribution on the on the on the bottom of the slide for n equals zero. You get uh, a scale multiplicity, so basically a scale value of the number of particles inside your jets. For n equal one, you get it's uh, by by design it's one. And then uh, if you go to higher value of n, uh, you get some curves which are uh, uh, decreasing as function of the jet PT. 
if you look at the same curves, uh, the same observable, sorry, varying the, res the resolution parameter R, you get some uh, decreasing uh, curves on the on the plot on the lower right on the upper right, sorry. And uh, this is again showing you uh, uh, that uh, more uh, uh, that the bigger means the consequence also of uh, of uh, of uh, uh, the re the radius of the jets and of uh, the way the particles are organized inside your jets. So the measurements are in agreement with uh, uh, PTA. And uh, it's, uh, we are using them, uh, uh, hopefully, to uh, try to do the same measurement in the future in uh, lead lead. And this is because uh, in lead lead, you have a lot of background, of fluctuating background. Uh, and in the moment space, uh, we have there is a theory paper from uh, Kajari and Al advocating that you can use uh, uh, those, this momentum space to, uh, uh, to uh, define a new ways to handle the Situation of the background in a more precise way, and uh, we want to try it. So you have five more minutes left. Yes. Okay. So then, uh, if uh, if uh, you look at the transverse plane uh, again uh, with fragmentation functions, you can uh, define the so-called JT uh, uh, observable, which is uh, uh, plotted on as on in blue uh, on, on the in the sketch on the on the, uh, the top of the slide. Uh, and you can see that uh, these measurements uh, were compared to various Monte Carlos uh, at 50, 5 uh, TV for 50, 60 to 80 uh, TV jets. Um, and uh, they are in quite nice agreement uh, for JT greater than 0.5. And if you go to lower JT, you get an agreement with Herwick, uh, but we, which is uh, under, underestimating the data by about 20%. Then, uh, if you start to, to look at the next class of uh, gesturic measurement, which was uh, introduced before, the so called groom, uh, uh, grooming uh, observables. Uh, so, what is grooming? Grooming allows to isolate uh, fertility processes uh, in the shower evolution. So what you do is you just uh, get your, your cluster your cluster jets uh, by using anti gt and then uh, you recluster uh, the, con the constituents using the uh, chemid uh, 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 algorithm and then uh, you get kind of the the history of the of the cluster of the clustering which is a uh, uh, wind uh, uh, to you um, and then uh, you can uh, uh, search for hard splittings, for instance, uh, by using some uh, condition, which we call a, a soft drop condition. OK, uh, the first of the I want to discuss is so-called uh, ZG, which is a transverse momentum balance between uh, two uh, hard uh, subjects. And uh, so this was measured uh, in uh, a few uh, systems, uh, and you have a, a sketch on, on how it was, uh, uh, what it is. I mean, it's just you look at the harder uh, splitting of your jet uh, uh, in your in your history, and then you make a plot of it. And if you measure it in uh, in PLED, uh, you see that you get a peak at uh, lower the G. So you have uh, jets which are mostly in balance. Uh, and less jets which are balanced, you have a, a difference uh, uh, you know, in the PT of your constituents. And you have a nice agreement with PTR. Then uh, you can do the same kind of measurement in uh, PP and the lead. Uh, and this was done at uh, the same energy. And uh, you can see that uh, in the, in the, on the um, I mean, if you look at the, at the, at the if you compare both, uh, both systems, you have no modifications within uh, experimental uncertainties. Um, and then you can look also at uh, the NSD uh, variable, which is kind of the number of three of splitting. Um, and this is also uh, uh, compatible with no modification within, uh, within uh, uh, systematics or very small ones. Then the next variable you can, you can look at is uh, the RG uh, uh, variable. Uh, this variable is defined on the, on the right uh, sketch. 
So basically, it's the same variable as the, as the, the, as the jet resolution parameter, which is a, a square root of uh, uh, delta x, uh, delta, delta uh, y, and delta phi square. But uh, in, this, in, in this case, you just use grooming. Uh, so you get, uh, of course, a smaller uh, radius. And uh, what you can do is, uh, is look at the plot. Uh, and you can see that uh, missing some text here. Uh, the, the, so you, you, you are looking basically at the core of your jet. And uh, you can see that uh, you have a small difference uh, between uh, PP and, uh, and lead lead uh, in the lead lead case. Okay, then again, uh, if I look at the same observable, but this time uh, as function of uh, delta of uh, theta g of theta g, which is uh, the ratio between the groomed radius over the radius, you can see that uh, you have uh, uh, the you are looking at yeah, the core of the jets, and you have narrow narrow jets in uh, the lead uh, compared to PP collisions, and you are sensitive to the QGP radiation lens. Okay. Then you can look at uh, the at measurements done inside the lune plane. Uh, so the lune plane is uh, uh, a plane defined as function of uh, kT and uh, delta r. Uh, kT being the PT of the subleading jet of the subleading jet uh, sign delta r, and delta r being defined as I told you before as a function of eta and phi. And uh, we're, we're so at 15 you, minutes, so I hope you're going to wrap it up soon. Sorry. Yeah, I have uh, two more slides. Is that fine? Just, yeah. Okay. Into question so, time. Okay. I, I try to, uh, to, be, to be fast, but it's almost done. So um, if you look at in, inside this plane, which is defined on the top uh, left, uh, you can you 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 can make uh, measurements and uh, uh, so if you look at the the, the the plots which are on the bottom of the slides, um, you can see data in this uh, in this uh, loom plane, uh, and uh, you can uh, see if you predict them um, uh, as function of uh, the log of kt. Uh, you can see that you have a suppression. Uh, uh, seen at large delta or small one over the R, and an enhancement uh, at uh, small delta R. Okay, and uh, basically, um, uh, it's it is uh, what we can uh, we can see there. And uh, in uh, I should have uh, maybe started uh, by uh, PP uh, in the PP case. We compare several uh, algorithms, several grooming algorithms uh, called uh, dynamical grooming, and you can see that they all converge uh, at uh, uh, at uh, higher values of kT, and they are quite well reproduced with Monte by Monte Carlos. I will let you read the motivation, which I script uh, to be a bit faster. There, on the on the top of the slide, then. The last mod, uh, measurement I would like to mention here is the first measurement of the dead count effect uh, in PP at uh, 13 TV by using uh, iterative uh, declustering. So basically, I think that you all know uh, what is the dead count effect. Uh, it is uh, a universal property of uh, relative theories. Uh, uh, it uh, predicts a separation of emission from a uh, radiator, for instance, the quark within an angle, which is smaller than the mass of a quark over the energy of the quark. And basically that's a bit like what I told you about uh, when I was showing you the pattern shower evolution and uh, co the color coherence uh, of QCE. So basically you, you, you would expect uh, if you compare a heavy quark to, uh, to uh, old quarks or to light quarks, you expect uh, uh, gluons radiated at small kT, uh, which will be uh, restricted to so have less, uh, and the fragmentation function, which will be picked at uh, uh, large values uh, for heavy quarks. So we. So uh, I, I think we need to, to wrap it up. I think we've gone through the question time now. So could you okay. skip to the summary? Yeah. 
Okay, so uh, should I read or should you should you just read this? Maybe maybe we could just leave it and and ask if there are any uh, burning questions here. Yeah. So thank you very much for this very comprehensive talk. Uh, there's certainly a, a lot of very interesting results there from Elise. All right, are there burning questions? All right, I do not see them. So let's thank our speaker again. Thank you very much. Um, Welcome. I'm sorry okay. it was a bit too long. No, no, don't. So our next speaker is Rajesh Kumar. Is he here? I don't see him in the participant list. Does anyone have any information about the speaker? Okay, um, then I would ask uh, Pietro, if, if you are willing to give your talk now, I, I don't think yes, we're gonna have people- Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I'm going to share the slides. All right. Okay. So, uh, can you confirm you see it uh, full full screen? We see it full screen, and uh, he's going to tell us about hadronization studies uh, again in Elise. So, why don't you go ahead, and I'll give you a warning when you have five minutes left. Okay. Thanks. I will report uh, with this hadronization studies results from uh, Elise at uh, the LHC. Uh, just to, to start, this is the kind of standard, the boring physics motivation slides that we have in this kind of talks where we just remind the factorization approach that is so useful to test perturbative QCD calculations, in particular uh, when uh, hard scattering and larger quark mass are uh, involved. However, all this holds to the extent that the non-perturbative part can be captured in a universal part on distribution function and fragmentation functions. I will mainly focus on fragmentation uh, given, the, given the talk. And if we consider a kind of state of the art paper back to five years ago from Lisovi and others, they put together uh, measurements from different uh, collision systems. And uh, here uh, there are the results for the charm fragmentation fractions. And you see that uh, there is a nice agreement between uh, the different collision system, even if at that time from LAC there was just one result uh, uh, available for a charmed baryons that uh, is, uh, is listed in, in the slide, but the overall picture was uh, fragmentation is well understood. Now, uh, you heard already today several talks on, on Ellis. Uh, I just want to say about this detector that given his uh, particle identification capabilities, tracking, and the low PT reach, uh, <clears throat> given the relatively low uh, magnetic field employed in the experiment, we are particularly well suited for these hadronization studies. And in particular, we can provide information uh, for charmed baryons in a rapidity region complementary to LHCB. And here there is a kind of uh, grand summary of uh, all our uh, measurement during run one and uh, run two. And uh, you see that uh, for uh, the uh, adronic decays and also for semi-leptonic decays, we have uh, many channels studies, and uh, we added the two charmed baryons to the family of uh, what we are able to observe in run two with the sigma c and the xi c, and I will report specifically results also on that. And uh, uh, once you have this data set, you can in particularly play with the baryon to meson ratio that is specifically sensitive to adronization, and you can make comparison uh, with the light flavor sector, thanks to the lambda over key zero ratio. Now, um, in, in this game, in a sense, the dimensions are a kind of perfect candle. See here, you have uh, some of the most recent uh, uh, results compared to various perturbative uh, QCD calculations. And uh, you can see that uh, there is a, a good agreement and the, these calculations are able within uncertainties to uh, describe uh, the data. 
Um, and uh, uh, you heard the, um, before the talk from uh, Fabrizio, so I will not detail too much uh, this analysis, but speaking about adronization recently, uh, being able to distinguish the non-prompt and prompt component for uh, the dimensions, then this in turn allowed the, the measurement of the fragmentation fractions of heavy quark to strange and non-strange mesons that again are compatible with uh, previous uh, measurement with so with the different uh, uh, center of mass energy and the collision system so again we could say in the fragmentation region uh, everything is well understood but we had some surprise these are results now becoming a little bit old was the first one with the lambda silver d0 for uh, alice where we noted uh, but in a different rapidity region, a uh, tension with the existing at the time result from uh, LACB and a kind of super tension with the values that were measured previously in other uh, collision uh, system. This was also mentioned by Charlotte in the first day of this conference. However, we have to say that in the past, this was uh, somehow already noted with difference between uh, the fragmentation fractions to baryons between uh, LEP and uh, CDF. Um, now, these results have been uh, uh, refined with better uh, statistics and improved analysis technique with the sample at 5 TV. And uh, here uh, uh, you have uh, the measurement uh, of the <clears throat> lambda C that has been recently submitted uh, to, to journal, as, as well as uh, a, a renewed study of the baryon to meson ratio with uh, comparison with uh, different uh, models that uh, uh, differently from, let's say, standard PTI and uh, standard generators. Then we have uh, here the comparison with uh, three models, one from Ian Rapp that uh, uh, it is a statistical adronization model, but uh, then assumes an observed higher mass resonance states uh, predicted by the resonant uh, quark model. And then you can see that is better able to describe the model as well as another uh, calculation from the Catania group where there is a mix of uh, fragmentation and coalescence systems. Uh, also in, 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 in PP, coalescence is a mechanism normally invoked more for heavy ion collisions. And uh, there are um, several tunes of, of PTIA proposed by Christiansen and Scans that basically they introduced some enhanced color reconnection mechanism, in particular with three leg junctions that are able to increase the uh, production of, uh, uh, of baryons. And, and then in the meantime, we had also another result from CMS that uh, uh, confirmed a value larger than what was measured in uh, previous uh, collision systems. And uh, if we can put together the different uh, information uh, here we mm, let's say made a compilation of uh, the barium to meson ratio in the light flavor proton over pi and lambda over k0 and then uh, on the charm uh, sector and you see that we see a kind of intriguing similarity even if per se the adronization is quite different due to the hard scale involved for uh, charred and uh, um, bottom Baryons, because indeed we have a nice result from the LHCB uh, collaboration where they see first uh, a dependence on PT of the fragmentation uh, of, of the <clears throat> baryon, uh, lambda V baryon, and uh, the baryon to meson ratio, these uh, five points of uh, LHCB, we could uh, superimpose here, and they will stay pretty close to the cures that have been measured uh, by, uh, by ELIS. And uh, if we, again, also in particular, given the conference, we make some kind of story, uh, we have uh, uh, that uh, in, in previously, we had uh, even between uh, electron positron <clears throat> collision in a, a quark or a trigluons, some differences, and then the results that we are measuring, even if are much more extended in PT, are not so close in the reality for the lambda over K0 of what has been measured in deep scattering at Zeus. 
So we tried to disentangle making a more differential study on final state on multiplicity. So here you still have the ratio, but in different class of multiplicities, they seem all packed, but let me just put the lowest and the highest multiplicity class. You see that there is a kind of uh, clear uh, announcement dependent on the multiplicity. Standard PTA is completely unable to uh, guess this behavior seen in the data, but it's quite impressive as um, enhanced color reconnection mechanism are uh, able to uh, obtain a much better agreement with data. To conclude this part, let me add that then we put together observation in different collision systems. And here you have as a function of multiplicity in different intervals of PT, uh, the lambda C over D zero ratio. And you see that there is an increase in intermediate PT from proton-proton to lead-lead multiplicity, but the ratio at highest proton-proton multiplicity at the very end are similar to what we observe in that range of multiplicity for lead-lead. Another intriguing observation is that uh, we have a distance with the electron-positron ratio, but this distance decrease and substantially approach the lap values at, uh, I, at IPT. Um, let's move to uh, the uh, additional baryons that uh, recently we measured. And so here you see uh, the result for the sigma C that is observed the decaying in a lambda C plus a soft pions. And again, uh, you see that the two models from ENRAP and uh, enhanced the color reconnection mechanism are able to describe what uh, we see in the data, even also in terms of uh, lambda C that uh, are uh, um, coming from the uh, decay of uh, uh, sigma C. However, uh, if you make the ratio baryon to baryon ratio, we see that one of this model is unable to uh, predict uh, uh, the fraction of uh, feed down from sigma C states to uh, lambda C, uh, while uh, instead uh, the model from E and RAP is able to describe uh, this uh, behavior. This is not yet the end of the story, uh, because interestingly, the uh, other variants that we are observing, the XIC, here is in a decay of a it to XI plus again a soft pion. Uh, then um, we have uh, in, uh, in this case, uh, let's say a failure. I mean, the models that are able to, to do a good description of, of data doesn't seem to capture uh, the, uh, what we are seeing in the data uh, for uh, the uh, XIC. Um, so uh, this uh, brings me uh, to some of the conclusions that I wanted to discuss, that in a sense, uh, certainly the charmed variants uh, at LAC uh, were a surprise. And from a proton-proton baseline to search an announcement in lead-lead, this was the, is the usual script for experiment as a Alice uh, uh, trying to achieve a baseline in proton-proton and then to see if something change uh, in, in lead-lead. Then we, sound, we found something quite different between proton-proton and electron-proton and uh, era result, let's say. So is the collision system that makes the difference or is the collision energy? Because we, we have to, to keep in mind that the, uh, the collision energy is also substantially uh, different. The, the other achievement that I hope I convinced you is that there is now a dependence of the fragmentation fraction from PT that is firmly established and it has been seen also by different uh, LHC collaboration. We noted that this similarity between light flavor and heavy flavor families and uh, altogether this resulted with three different C variants and we expect to have something else soon and the possibility to access the low PT region, region allow us to test and set constraints on different hadronization models, but maybe it could be more correct to say to, to, to address the baryonization problem. 
in uh, an environment like the one from uh, LHC that is a part on a rich uh, environment. We have additional measurements coming, putting together the different pieces. So uh, you can expect something from us on fragmentation fractions uh, relatively soon, and then uh, the total cross, uh, charm cross section. So stay tuned for upcoming results at summer conference. But uh, I would like to use my last minute uh, uh, to revisit, it, revisit the, the boring motivation slide with a kind of surprising, because uh, it looks like um, if this is the, the standard approach, now we are starting to see in the uh, fragmentation function part of, uh, of the adornization some kind of dependence, uh, so I put uh, uh, a row for the den density, some kind of dependence uh, from the density of the, uh, of the partons. And uh, in this sense, uh, the LAC is a perfect laboratory to study this dependence. Thanks. Okay, thanks a lot. And I, I apologize for not giving you a 10 minute warning, but you finished right on time. So uh, are there questions to this doc? Oh, I see a hand raised, sorry, who's is that? Uh, Will, go ahead. Uh, super, thank you. Um, could you please go back to where you were comparing um, the the wrap and he uh, calculations to the, I think the charm baryon um, to meson ratio. Um, we, and I thought this was really interesting because um, if I understood your, your early uh, slides on this, uh, the physics motivation for the, the wrap and he model is that there are these higher resonance states that are uh, influencing uh, this me, ratio. Uh, so you mean that, this, sorry, just to check, you mean this one? Uh, yes, yeah, so this was the early slide that, that motivated the, the RAP and HE model. And I'm, I'm gonna ask you an unfair question because I, I recognize you're not an expert in this, but I, I thought this was really interesting. So this showed that they sort of started, oh, okay, this is already the, the lambda to D, I see. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, okay, now I understand. And, and that was very helpful, okay. I, I, okay. I retract my question and I, I appreciate you clarifying that for me. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thanks a lot. Are there, are there other questions? Okay, I, I, there's, there's obviously a huge amount of data here. This is very interesting and I look forward to seeing what else comes. Okay. Then I, I propose we, we thank Pietro again. So thanks a, a lot. Thank you. Back to forward to getting in a place where we can actually clap for people again. Um, okay. And I believe we will close the session here. So thanks a lot everyone for attending and I hope to see you in person again soon. Thanks so much, Anne. Thank you. So I'll stop the recording and uh, put up a timer for 10 a.m. for the next session.